I'm going to hit record and we're recording. Um, so uh, Gary and I, you've chatted and I've chatted a couple times over the past few days, but for people who are going to see this for the first time, I'm going to give them an idea of who you are. Um, so Gary Hall and I went to the Olympics together in 96. Um, his sister and I swam together at the University of Arizona. Um, and uh, Gary and I were both sprinters, 50, um, 100 freestyle, which I feel like just means that we were um, naturally irreverent. And um, Gary is one of the most decorated sprinters in America. So holds five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 uh, Olympic medals. Um, in 1996, world record relays, American records like endlessly. Um, and then the ones that I like, I don't know if they're your favorites, but the gold medals in the 50 freestyle were pretty epic. Um, so uh, this is Gary Hall, a longtime friend. And I called him up, uh, I guess about a week and a half ago um, to see if, uh, he'd be down to talk about what uh, postponement at the time was just a potential postponement of the Olympics. And since we've chatted has become an actual postponement. And um, my thinking behind this was, you know, when I was a swimmer, and I don't know if this was the case for you, Gary, was I often felt like the questions I was asked as an athlete weren't um, necessarily relevant to what it meant to being an athlete, like I felt like the questions were just a little bit over to the left or to the right and didn't really hold kind of the gnarliness of what it meant to um, be an elite athlete at this level. And um, when I heard that they might be postponing the Olympics, um, I thought that it might be nice to start talking about what that actually means for an athlete. Like it's not, uh, I think that the word postponement is actually really misleading. Um, it's like a restarting, like it's, it's like a whole, like a, an athlete, like you basically have your whole career for this one moment. And what that means is it's like the timing is everything. So, um, so I guess that was, that could be the first place that we could start. And I'm really, um, I'm so grateful to you for taking some time to have a chat. It's yeah, nice to see you. Yeah, so good to reconnect and uh, do this fun thing. Um, yeah, you know, when people, put, uh, athletes talk about uh, sacrifice, it's, it, it's really not something that many uh, people that aren't involved in sport um, can, can appreciate. I think that we celebrate uh, college graduation because it's a four or five year eight year commitment for others, but it's, it's a long commitment uh, for a lot of people um, and, and a dream realized. And, and think about what a big thing that is in most people's lives uh, to graduate from college. Um, big milestone, something worth celebrating, obviously. Um, you know, for an Olympic athlete, it's like um, a, a college is it, just a, a four year cycle. Um, many of these athletes who have, have reached this position to be a contender, uh, to qualify for Olympic Games, they've dedicated 16 years. Yeah. Um, many, uh, many, sometimes more. Um, and, and so um, it's this huge uh, mountain to climb. And so uh, the sacrifices that these guys are making to get to that position, it's so consuming. Uh, the sport to be competitive against talented athletes like Michael Phelps today. You have to make up that talent gap uh, by training, you know, up to six, seven, eight hours every single day right. and really pushing the, the, the limits of human capacity. Uh, that is what the Olympic Games is about. You know, how fast can the human body go? How, how, how much weight can it uh, bear? And, and, and all these different challenges. Um, and, and we push ourselves in competition uh, to the point of failure, um, but also uh, we, we mimic that in the training. So every yeah. single day, it's, you're, you're pushing yourself, pushing yourself as, as far as you can. That's important, right, for people to understand that it's like, you know, the Olympics is an amazing moment, but 
I don't know if this was the case for you, but the Olympics for me were just like, I had been trained to normalize it so that it was just this thing that I, that was not spectacular. I mean, it was spectacular in its gravitas, of course, but it was like, I got sat down when I was 12 and was like, so this is your path and this is how this is going to work. So by the time you're at the Olympics, you're like, well, I should be here. And so behind all of this, this moment that everyone sees on television at the Olympics of failure, behind that is like hours and hours and hours of us doing that, like physically pushing our bodies to fail, to mimic what, it, what we're going to do on that particular day. And I don't know, you know, sometimes I think that when people think of athletes, and we can just talk about swimming, because it's one of the most popular Olympic sports, is it's like, people talk about it and get excited about it and love it. And I just, I wonder what it would be like for us to talk about, like, it's actually at a massive, like a massive exciting in some instances, but it's at a massive cost. Like it is a real thing to have a body move that fast in the water. And this is what this actually looks like. Like it's, um, I guess that wasn't necessarily a question, but just more of an add-on to what you were just saying. Um, so what does that, can you talk a little bit about what it means to have this notion of like the competition that you're working towards not, hap not happen? Like I... Yeah, so um, you'll also hear athletes talk about visualization, kind of seeing the atmosphere, oh, that's so recreating it, creating it beforehand, not recreating it, creating it in, in your mind and, and in anticipation and rehearsal, right? Practice, uh, visualization, that's what that is. Yeah. And so I remember um, after the 96 Olympics, um, about two weeks after those games, I got on a plane and I flew to Sydney, Australia, the home of where the next Olympics was going to be. The pool had just been completed and I just wanted to see it. I just wanted to get that visual and that anticipation. This is four years down the road, you know, forecasting. And so um, it is important. And a lot of these athletes that have been training for Tokyo for this summer, lining up continuous seasons to peak at a certain point. And that's a, something that oh, people that aren't involved in sport um, are, are less familiar. There's a, a training and a tapering process through a season. Swimming is very unusual. Um, unlike other sports, um, you know, you'll go, you'll you train for a single meet for six months to a year. Yeah. And, and so... Um, it's not like uh, basketball where you're playing a game, two or three games a, a, a week, and if you have a bad game, you've got a chance to redeem yourself. No. Uh, you know, this, so this training cycle in swimming is, is exceptional. And through this entire training, every day in practice, while you're pushing yourself, you're, you're visualizing that perfect race at the end of the season. And so to disrupt that and, and have that be now a moving target, it's something that is uh, a lot of athletes, particularly swimmers, are unaccustomed to. And how many of them will be able to adapt and pivot and, and, and reset? Um, you know, those are going to be the ones that uh, fare better than others. Right. And I guess my other question, it's something that you and I briefly talked about, is it's like, so swimming age isn't as much of an, uh, a constraint as it used to be when you and I were swimming, right? So, I mean, I think that at 29, you were one of the oldest swimmers to go to the Olympics and the one after that was 34. But then, you know, we've since seen older swimmers kind of come back. But I, I know that it's still a young sport. And... Um, and I know that some of those athletes, particularly some of the sprinters, are getting older. So it's like the idea of having to hold that for one more for one more year seems like I mean, you know, swimming's been such a long time ago for me, but seems devastating because I know then what it was like to have to adjust to not swimming. Yes. Yeah, it, it, there's definitely, um, you know, a, a, a window, right, where we are physically at our prime. And there's going to be some that are shifting in 
to the sport, um, younger swimmers that, um, you know, will benefit from having another year of maturing and, um, and additional training. Yeah, right. I didn't even think of that, but yeah, that's true. Um, right. So an advantage for some, but obviously if you're 34 and hoping to make, you know, the team waiting a, a year as you're, as you're starting to, that, that slide um, uh, from peak performance, um, peak age, I, I should say, um, then, um, you know, that's going to be a, a consideration for others uh, in a negative way. Can you explain a little bit more? I mean, I, maybe it's something that we can do together, what it means to like train and then taper. Cause I think that's a pretty specific thing that swimmers do. Like the closest reference that I have just cause I trained with a lot of wrestlers was like making weight. Like it was a very specific process that was really in the wrestler's case was like, and weightlifters like really painful because they ended up having to like run around with plastic bags and try and shed this weight so that they could make weight and then compete. But, um, but tapering for swimmers is really specific. And I don't think it's a term that people are fully aware of. Can you yeah. try and unpack so, that a little uh, bit? Imagine if you only um, ran, it, when you run, like walk or run, if you only go up a very steep incline, you only go uphill all the time. Everywhere you go, it's uphill, it's steep, and you're climbing like that. If you do that over the course of six months, where every step is, is an ascension, and, and, and uh, it's resistance training. Um, the idea is that once you get to level ground, you're going to be able to run so much faster because it, it does, you're not going uphill right. anymore. So this is the concept in a nutshell of resistance training. And the theory is that through the course of a, a season, you break yourself down and, and just endure this uh, state of exhaustion um, for such a long period of time. And, and, and other, you know, in military, the Navy SEALs, it's, they do something similar, right? Like they break themselves down and, and challenge themselves and, 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 um, and, and, you know, and ultimately prevail. But in the case of an athlete, you know, you, you break yourself down, you, you, you remain exhausted for such a long period of time. And then you take that exhaustion away and all of a sudden it feels like you've got super energy. Um, and if you can get that timing just right, because if you wait too long and taper off, uh, that means scale back the amount of intense training that you're doing. Um, you know, you'll feel great and, and rested and, and have all this energy that you're not used to having. Um, and, and ultimately the kind of peak, um, for this, through this tapering process. But if you wait too long, extend that resting period, right. just even a, a few days, uh, for some, uh, yeah. others, you know, there's a weak window maybe where you're just in your top form. Then the uh, base of your aerobic training starts to falter. And um, and then and then it's uh, not as as good. So it's Did a, a trampoline it? effect where you're looking for that double bounce. Totally. Did you ever have a um, taper that like bombed totally bombed out that you can remember? Or I, mean, um, I want to paint the scene. So one of the things I loved about Gary was that he always seemed to like not be making an effort at all, which I took and internalized as like, I basically can just have a really bad attitude, which is not what you had, Gary, but it is what I had. And so I just, um, you know, you were such a beautiful swimmer, but you were also kind of like deeply um, playful. And so to hear you, um, it's really nice to hear you talk about like the specificity of training and the seriousness and then the exhaustion of it because when you and I were swimming together like you always seem to kind of like be fine but I realize now that you know you were probably as exhausted and as we all were in in there <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you. There were a lot of compliments in that. I uh, do appreciate um, that. And, and uh, you know, sport evolves. Uh, we, we learn from the previous generation what works and what doesn't work. And, you know, I, I, intuitively, I remember having as a sophomore in high school uh, intense conversations with my swim coach on the pool deck at 530 in the morning before morning swim practices about 
why, you know, why do the sprinters do the same practice as the people that are swimming the mile? In track, and, in track and field, the, the, the cross country runner does not do the same workout as the 100 meter dash guys, but you've got the shot put people, the pole vaulter people, the distance runners, the sprinters, everybody mixed in and everybody's doing the exact same formula type of training where a, you know, a coach, a lot of coaches at the time in the 80s and the 90s would have an entire season of workouts written out beforehand. Right. And, and we all did them. So it and was you like, walked everybody. It didn't matter if you were tall or short or strong. Yeah. Or, 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 or a sprinter or, like me and Gary. Sure. Like yeah. you'd show everybody up to would. practice and it'd be like 10, 16, 50s. And you're like, what? Why am I doing, why, why am I doing that? Typically this is the point at which I would get kicked out of practice or just go to the diving well or something. But um, yeah, that, and has that changed? It has changed and, and for the better, you know? And, and I remember I had a, I came out of a high volume uh, training program. Yeah. So I, I did have a reputation as being lazy because I was a sprinter and our race is just shorter distance than the mile people. Yeah. or the 200 butterfly people. Right. And it was always a inner, you know, competitive group. You know, athletes are a competitive bunch. And so everybody wants that kind of claim. We work harder. There's a, a point of pride, in it, right? Like, and sprinters never got that respect. But we were doing something that was, so I, I, intuitively, I, I knew, I always was able to listen to my body and have the courage to speak up or question the authority of a, of a swim coach. Yeah. Um, why are we doing this? This is, you know, they would take that as a challenge to their authority, but I just was curious because right. it didn't make sense to me. Um, and so I, at a pretty early age, uh, was able to kind of break away from that and, and, and just start, you know, it, when your body needs rest or you feel like a little pang, a uh, shoulder or something like that, back off, right? It, right. It's pushing through that pain that gets a lot of people injured or get an overuse overload injury, like a rotator cuff goes out or a knee or something like that. And so I always took that initiative to listen to my body. Yeah. And, and, the and, and then the, 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 that continued to develop it. And all of the training became race specific. Yeah. So my race lasted 21 seconds long. Um, you know, all of the aerobic based training that I was doing, that's painful. Uh, that's tough. I, I respect that. But the pain that I was feeling at the end of a uh, practice where we're going 10,000 meters is very different than the pain I'm feeling at the end of a 50 freestyle or the 100 totally. freestyle. Yeah. It's not related at all. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. It's like uh, getting, hitting your thumb with a hammer versus getting cut with a razor blade. Like, yeah. And I remember, the, you know, it was like, I guess this was at the very end of my swimming and you swam against the um, Russians as well. Like they started, they were training in a really different way that almost was like, I think the, um, the dawn of this like very specific type of training for sprinters with pop off and what we saw, cause we were at training camps with them. So I was on the French team, Gary was on the US team. And when we would train and go up to Font Romeu in the Pyrenees, oftentimes the Russian swimmers were there at the same time. So we got to see how they were training. And I was always like, I want to be training with Popoff because he's not doing anything right now. <laughs> like I just was like, he just is swimming really slow and then does a couple sprints, lifting weights, running around a little bit, and then he's done. Meanwhile, what I was doing was like trying to do the same practices like, you know, again, the long distance swimmers. Um, so that's, that's super interesting that that has changed just overall. That's, that's pretty cool. What would you, um, I mean, what would you, you, you know, like me have some folks who are still swimming. Um, I know one other kind of Olympian who's getting ready to go or was, what would you, you know, and you still do clinics, which is cool. Like you've started doing that again. That's awesome. What would you tell, like, what would you tell our friends who are younger than us who have 
suddenly had like their thing taken away from them? Well, this, this is not taken away, it's postponed. Right. Right now we're all in a state of panic, um, generally speaking. And so let's not blow this out of proportion. Uh, maintaining the health and safety of athletes and spectators is much more important totally. than getting this timing right. If you are one of the best in the world this year, you can do it again next year. Um, right. So, um, you know, I, I, I love that. that. I'm okay just, with that. You know, That's cool. That's good. It depends. And, 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 and whether you succeed or not is being determined right now. Because if you are viewing this as this is my chance blown, that's a negative approach that is going to ultimately impact your performance. If you're like, this is postponing, it's buying me another season, I can grow the base that I've already achieved this past year, um, you know, and, and, and again, those that are able to pivot and adapt, survive and thrive. Right. That's true. I mean, that could be said in so many cases but i love that you know like i love this idea of like if you're the best this year you're gonna be the best next year and and i do love this idea of like just you know challenging which i think a lot of athletes can you know challenge themselves to pivot mentally because ultimately like the physicality of it there there are a handful of athletes where that might be the case but for most people it's going to be like okay so you get to take a break a little early this year like everyone's got four weeks off because none of us can train with anybody really so just like go run around and do some cross training or whatever summers come early the month of august is here early everybody go chill and then and then to just be like, okay, well, so then we'll restart. They'll set a date and I'm just going to like go at it. I, I love that. I mean, I, I think maybe that's, is the, the difference always kind of was for me is I always was like, oh man, I mean, I hated swimming, which I don't, did you hate swimming or did you enjoy it? I, there's things that I liked about it. I tried to focus on those things. <laughs> but I love that. Cause I was like, I was always like, ah fuck it you know which which um which i like the idea of encouraging the young athletes who are out there like you actually can do this like your mind can do this and your body is already there like you've done it right um that's that's some good that's good stuff that's yeah good. and and as you know when you compete at that level uh it, Mark Spitz once said swimming is 90% mental, and that's totally, totally. not true. That's, I, I, that's totally not true. He's, he's wrong. It's not. I can't today just like mentally will myself to get back to the Olympic Games and stuff like that. There's a lot of training involved. So, but at a certain level, at a certain level of sport, yeah. then yes, that is true. Anybody that is physically capable of qualifying for a finals at the Olympic Games is physically capable of winning it. The difference is the mental, right? And, right? and that's going to be the difference of anybody that's qualifying for the team next year is going to be the mental part. Because um, it's a, a level playing field across the board. Uh, people in Russia and Brazil and everywhere else, they're all in quarantine too. They're all dealing with the same stresses, um, outside pressure and, and uh, that, that everyone else is dealing with. Right. Uh, with this. So um, it's those who are going to be able to navigate that better mentally that, that, that are going to uh, prevail. I like that. I mean, so you and I have been chatting for about half an hour. I don't want to take up much more of your time, Gary, but um, I think that that's a, good, that's a good place to start. I mean, it, the whole idea is to just offer a little bit more insight into what being an athlete at that level is. It's complicated. It's also complicated to talk about not all the athletes know how to talk about what they're going through or what they do. Um, and, uh, and I feel really great about some of the older generations just being like, so this thing just happened and like, you're going to be okay. You can like, you can rally cause you're awesome. Cause you already were ready, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah well, you know, I, I hope that anybody who's a contender, uh, you know, to, to qualify for the Olympic Games, uh, they already know that they're very good, uh, you know, so there's some encouragement there. They, you're a great athlete, and it sounds like cliched, raw, raw, coach halftime locker room type of encouragement. Let's hear it. Let's go. <laughs> Champions aren't determined by the victories. The champions are who, who, the, the people that deal with the adversity yeah. most, right? And uh, that's applicable to uh, everything beyond sport as well, totally. especially trying times, no matter what you're doing. That uh, ability to, uh, when the going gets tough, the tough get going, true grit type of buckle down, let's adapt and change and figure this thing out and, and, and do the best we can with the situation that we've got, um, those, that's, you know, that's what's going to determine uh, the, the, the true champions. Yeah, and like you said, like, I think that that is something as former Olympians that we can share is just like, so now's the time, like now's the time where you step up, where you adapt, because it is, it's complicated right now for everybody. And um, yeah. your words are really wise and, generous Gary thanks a lot yeah thank you a lot. <laughs> I'm gonna um I'm gonna stop recording and then we can say uh goodbye Does that work okay yeah, sure. cool.